Hello and welcome to the Still Garden Guide. My name's Jane Moore and I'm a professional gardener and I'm welcoming you back into my own garden to give you a few hints and tips, a few ideas on what to do in your garden this autumn. In days gone by at this time of the year, I'd have been telling you to have a really good tidy up to make your garden look spick and span for the winter, but times have changed and my thinking's changed along with them. Nowadays, I'm much more concerned about making my garden a good habitat for wildlife. And that means not being quite so ready with the secateurs, not being quite so brutal with the cutting back. These days, it's a little bit more a question of as and when, a little bit more sprucing up rather than being too heavy handed. One of the things I am going to do though, is I'm going to tidy up these lilac squirrels. This is Sanguisorba lilac squirrel, which was one of my favourite plants of the summer, but it really has had its moment now. And I'm just going to take the flower heads off because I'm actually quite enjoying this autumnal foliage. It's got some really nice, quite pretty little autumnal tints and it won't go on forever, but it is giving me a little bit of a moment now, which I'm quite enjoying. A couple of weeks time and I'll take the leaves off as well. But for the moment, I'm quite enjoying these yellowy hues. Another thing I'm gonna cut back is this peony. Look at it. It's not doing anything for anyone, is it? It really is a tired looking specimen. But underneath it, look at that. I've got a lovely darling little cyclamen flowering away. So I'm gonna take the peony off right at ground level and reveal this glorious little cyclamen so we can all enjoy it. But it's not all about cutting things back at this time of the year. This is a really good time to collect a few seeds and I've got quite a few to collect. One of the plants that I want to collect seeds from is this sweet rocket, Hesperus matronalis. I planted this in my garden earlier on this year and it's done really well. It's flowered beautifully. In fact, it's still flowering, which is one of the reasons I want to collect some seeds from it. Um, I've got a piece of paper in the bottom of my trug here to collect some of the seeds that are already dry and falling out. Um, you can probably see. And another one that I want to collect is this. This is uh, Nigella. Again, I sowed it earlier on this year and it's done really well. And that's one of the reasons I want to collect them. Not only do you save money by collecting your own seeds, but also these plants have done well in my garden. So the chances are they're going to do really well again. It's kind of written into their DNA, which is why I want to collect the seeds from them. I mean, you're not going to collect seeds from a rubbish plant, are you? You're only going to collect seeds from a good plant. And it's such a nice thing to do. Now I've collected a few of these, I'm going to take them indoors, let them dry off and then pack it them up. Oh, it's cold out there. It's nice to get in the warm. Um, these sweet rockets that I've picked, some of them are still a bit green and they're going to have to dry off, but this is the perfect place for them to do it. These ones, they're going to have the most beautiful seeds inside them, but they definitely need to ripen and dry off, which they can do here. Some of them have already ripened beautifully and in fact are dropping the seeds like mad. Uh, some of them will have scattered all already all over the ground, but I've still got some of these pods that have still got seeds in. As well as the nigella, one of the other things that I really like to collect is calendula seeds. These are fantastic and you just take off the whole seed heads and they gradually, as they dry off, you can just break them apart and they'll turn into these rather marvellous little curly seeds. They're like, they're like little caterpillars, I think, little crescent moons and they're so easy to grow. So I'm going to packet them up because they've actually dried off quite nicely. I'm going to label them, otherwise I forget, and put the year on, which is quite crucial. And then 
literally just bung them in these little envelopes. The seeds have to be absolutely dry for you to do this. If they're at all sort of green and wet, then they're liable to rot and then that's just, that's it, they're, they're ruined. And once I've packeted them, I keep them in a nice old biscuit tin. It's the perfect thing to keep them in. Keeps them nice and safe and dry. I know exactly where they are and I'll keep those in the shed probably or maybe the garage um, until I need them. Another plant that I've collected already this year is this. This is Amaranthus or Love Lies Bleeding. And I've been selecting this strain of Amaranthus myself for a good few years now. I originally bought a packet of seeds oh, more years than I care to remember ago and I've been gradually selecting it for the best and longest flowers. Look at that. When I've cut the stems all the seeds just drop out and you can probably hear them shaking around in the truck there. They're tiny tiny little dusty seeds and once they've all dropped out then I shall bag them up perfect for next year but even though the amaranthus is all finished now there's still quite a few things in flower in the garden so let's go out and i'll show you while lots of plants have finished flowering and even set seed already there's quite a few plants that are having a last brave flurry of flower before winter finishes them off and this is one of my favorites this is geranium roseanne it's absolutely beautiful flower. It's a hardy geranium. It's been flowering all summer long. It started in about June and has just carried on all the way through. We're at the end of October now. It is going to be the depths of winter that finishes this plant off. And the same probably applies for this one as well. This is the little daisy. It's Erigerin Karvinsky anus is the uh, Latin name, which is a bit of a mouthful. Um, it's a sun worshipper. It loves being at the bottom of this warm sunny wall and in New Zealand it's actually become a bit of a nuisance plant and it seeds itself so freely there it has become a bit of a pain. I am quite happy if it seeds itself around my garden I can tell you. And one plant that does seed itself around very freely is this one. This is Verbena bonariensis which is a lovely uh, long tall flowerer although the flowers are not very big they really do pack quite a punch of color and they're very freely produced over a long long season but the best thing about them is that these tiny little flowers are actually really rich in nectar and pollen and so they're excellent for feeding late butterflies and bees which makes it a brilliant plant to have in your garden but October and November are really the months for autumn colour. The first thing being this. This is Acer Garnet, one of the Japanese maples. Garnet by name and garnet by nature. It really is the most beautiful reds. And these lovely cut leaves as well. It has a sort of delicacy about it. And this quite nice sort of weeping shape, waterfally shape, which I think is really pretty. You can grow it in the ground. I've got mine in a pot, which I really like. Uh, I think it gives it a touch of elegance. And one of my top 10 trees for autumn colour has got to be this. And it's a great tree for a small garden. It's almost like a little shrub, really. This is Circus Forest Pansy. Look at the autumn colour on it. Isn't it beautiful? And it also has these lovely heart-shaped leaves trouble is with autumn colour is it's all a bit fleeting. It'll be over before we know it, which is why as gardeners we have to plan ahead and that is why I'm going to be starting planting my garlic. I've got the perfect spot here to plant some garlic because I lifted the pumpkins the other day and they have fruited beautifully and here's a little one that I've kept to show you. This is Red Curie, beautiful little pumpkin and a really good eater as well. So it's given me a really nice space to put some garlic in. I must admit I love growing garlic because it's such an easy crop to grow, what's not to like. You only need to put the cloves in about a couple of inches deep and about four inches, 10 centimetres apart. So one bulb is plenty for me to do my little bed here. 
and it's such an easy crop to grow because all you do is literally separate the bulb into cloves and pop them in. Forget about them all winter, they like to have a bit of cold and then come spring they will pop up and they will be ready to harvest in around about May, June, something like that. And if you've never had green garlic, it really is delicious. Main thing is to get a little bit of root with the clove when you pop it in the hole. So just separate it off like that, pop it in, cover it over, and that is job done. But these are not the only bulbs that I've got to plant. Us gardeners are such optimists. We're always looking to the future. And one of the biggest investments for the future you can make at the moment is planting bulbs. I am always so glad when I've taken a little bit of time to plant a few bulbs in the autumn. Come next spring, they will pop up and make my garden look glorious. A few times that I've missed doing it, I've always so regretted it. So I try and make myself do it, whatever, however cold the weather is. The good thing is, is that tulips actually really like a nice little bit of cold weather. And um, so it's not too late to plant them at all. As a rule of thumb, when you're looking to buy bulbs, make sure that they're nice and firm and plump. Give them a bit of a squidge. You can tell a lot by touch and have a look at them as well. Make sure they're not going mouldy or battered or bruised. That's a lot easier when they're loose bulbs like this. Not quite so easy when they're in a packet. But even so, you can take them off the shelf and have a, a good feel through the bag. Just see that they are nice and firm before you buy them. As well as planting tulips, one of my favourite things to plant are dwarf daffodils. I love these little baby daffodils. These are tete a -tete, one of the littlest um, daffodils, but it comes up and flowers in February. February! How fantastic is that? Just when you're thinking that winter is just going on and on forever, up these pop and bring a little ray of sunshine into your life. So I'm going to do a few pots of them now. I've also got this one. This is sailboat. Look at that, three bulbs. And uh, so that's going to give me a lot of flower. Sailboat, touch more elegant than tete a -tete, perhaps. Creamy white with a lemony yellow trumpet and lots and lots of flower. And I'm just gonna do a few pots full of them. The other great thing about bulbs, of course, is that it, they're not just for pots. Um, you can also naturalise them in the garden, you can put them in the lawn, you can do all sorts of things. But for the moment, I'm doing a few pots. I've got here just a good old sustainable compost. One of the nice things about daffodils is that you can really pack them into the pots. They really, really don't mind being jammed in together. And so I think I'm going to put the sailboats in here. As a general rule of thumb, when you're planting bulbs, it wants to go down three times the depth of the bulb. But that isn't quite so important when you're planting pots because they're not going to necessarily be in here forever. So you can actually plant them quite close to the surface. I often do a few pots full like this to give away as presents. They make really good Christmas presents. I reckon that's about it. I'm just going to put a little sprinkle of compost on the top. Now these need to stay outside and what I would do, or what I will do, is I am going to put a little bit of chicken wire over the tops of the bulbs just to keep the squirrels off them. Otherwise they will have them, they'll be digging them up and hoarding them and I'll end up with daffodils all over the place. One of the other little pots that I wanted to show you as well is these. These are a little thing called Scylla Sibirica, which just starting to sprout. And these are dainty, dainty little bulbs. They are absolutely cobalt blue when they flower. They are the most delicious shade of blue. And I'm just gonna do a little potful. These naturalize absolutely brilliantly and they will look wonderful if you put them under shrubs. They like being a little bit shady, so quite handy. Under shrubs, under trees, they'll look great. But I'm just going to do a couple of little pots full as presents for some friends. 
and again a little bit of the compost these ones I am going to put at the right depth. It's about three times the depth of the bulb. So if you look at that, that is probably about two centimeters. So it needs to go around about six centimeters down. And that applies to pretty much all the bulbs that you can think of. There we go. I quite like the simplicity of just having one plant in a pot, one single variety. But you can do the whole layered bulb thing where you put in several different types of bulbs in the one pot in layers on top of each other because the bulb depths are different. So having planted up my little pots, it's now time to move on to something a little bit bigger. I'm gonna plant up a slightly bigger pot this time with tulips. And I've got these fantastic tulip bulbs. This is a variety called National Velvet with lovely deep red velvety flowers and really huge stonking bulbs. They're lovely, absolutely lovely. The important thing to remember with tulip bulbs is that they really do need to go in at three times their depth. And so these will need to be, look at the size of that bulb. So another one again and another one again. So it's going to be fairly deep down in the pot and that's quite important. The other thing that you need to remember with tulips is that they mustn't be touching. If they're touching, they're very prone to spreading a rather nasty disease, which just leads to abject failure. And so it's actually really important that the bulbs are kept separate enough to uh, to not be touching. So I'm only going to put about, well, no more than 10 bulbs in this pot, which will still give me a really good show. Don't forget to give them a little squidge again, make sure that they're all right. There we go. And then I'm just going to fill in over the top and that is job done. But it's not just about planting in pots. You can naturalize tulips or any bulbs actually, pretty much um, straight out into the ground. And one of the things I'm gonna be doing is planting these alliums. Look at these, they're stonking great bulbs. They're absolutely wonderful. These are those giant onions, you know, that get really tall and you have these big purple flower heads on them. Um, they will flower in around about May, June, just when I'm thinking that's it for the bulbs, it's all over and done with, these will pop up and be an absolute glory. And believe me, it doesn't take too many of these to make a real impact in your garden. So that is just what I'm going to do. The crucial thing to remember when you're naturalizing bulbs, even from the tiny little sillas to whopping great bulbs like these alliums, is that you want them to look really random. You want them to look as if they planted themselves. Nature doesn't do rows and neither should you. And the easiest way to get that random look is really just to stand in the middle of your border with either a single bulb if they're big bulbs or a handful if they're smaller bulbs and literally just drop them. And where they land, that's where you plant them and that will give you your really random look. Now I've got my work cut out planting this lot so I'll see you in the depths of winter. Join me for a load of ideas, hints and tips for your garden. <laughs>